Okay, can I, uh, can I get proceedings on, uh, underway, please? Uh, welcome to uh, the third of the Barton School of Planning's uh, public lecture series for this academic year. Um, our lecture series, as you will see, is uh, generously sponsored by Capita, and I'd like to extend a special welcome to our colleagues from Capita this evening. Uh, my name is John Tomney. I'm Professor of Urban and Regional Planning here, and I'll chair this evening's proceedings. Uh, the aim of these lectures is to bring uh, leading scholars uh, and professionals in front of our audience of students, staff and guests to address uh, the important academic debates and pressing issues of, of policy uh, in practice. So that's the purpose of this series of lectures which we hold over the course of the academic year. Uh, and it's our custom to invite you to join us after the lecture at a reception in the South Cloister in the Wilkins Building. Um, it's a particular pleasure for me to introduce this evening's speaker. Uh, Dr. Michelle Dix is Managing Director of Crossrail 2. Uh, she studied civil engineering at Leeds University and started her career at the GLC, the Great London Council, after completing her PhD. Um, in, her PhD was in transport uh, and land use planning, uh, and she became a chartered civil engineer through the GLC's Transport Planning Graduate Scheme. Uh, Michelle later joined Halcrow Fox in the private sector, where she became the board director of urban transport planning before joining Transport for London in 2000. Um, she was co director of congestion charging, implementing, running, and expanding the scheme, as well as developing. Uh, the low emission zone before being appointed managing director for planning. Michelle became the managing director of Crossrail 2 in February 2015 uh, and since then has been responsible for developing Crossrail 2 and gaining funding and the powers for it. Um, so I suppose we can consider this a kind of early anniversary celebration of your appointment. Uh, Michelle's role uh, has seen her work, therefore, across all areas of transport in the capital, from designing bus lanes, uh, pedestrian modelling at London underground stations, to developing strategies for airports. Uh, she's worked with the mayor to develop the mayor's transport strategy and was instrumental in working with the mayor's roads task force to ensure uh, improvements to London road, London's road network. Uh, she also shares her knowledge and experience globally as a member of the policy board of the International Public Transport Association, UITP. She's won many accolades, including in 2014 being appointed a CBE uh, in the Queen's New Year's Honours List for services to transport in London. Uh, Sir Peter Hendy, former transport commissioner of London, now chairman of Network Rail, has described her, I quote, as the best transport planner in Britain, okay? So I hope, that, I hope you don't feel any pressure as a result of all of this, but um, we're expecting a lot this evening. That was in the past. Was it? Okay. Well, the Mayor of London, Boris Johnson, has said, <laughs> wise with words, considered in judgment, she's played a significant part in helping to shape this city's future transport. Particularly importantly, Michelle was born in Grimsby, yeah. <laughs> and uh, the Grimsby, uh, as the Grimsby Telegraph reported in 2012, while she may have risen to great heights in the world of engineering, she remains very much down to earth and likes nothing more than coming home to Grimsby, seeing her family and, of course, enjoying the country's best fish and chips. Obviously, the writer of that article hadn't been in all shields because that's where you get the country's <laughs> best relationships. Uh, Michelle has an active role in encouraging uh, women into transport and engineering uh, and mentors the new generation of London leaders as part of the not for profit Future of London project. She serves as, or she has also served as TFL's equality and inclusion champion, leading uh, TFL's work to ensure all of London's uh, diverse population benefits from access to transport and that the TfL workforce reflects the city it deserves. So I think we've all been looking forward to uh, 
hearing from you, Michelle. So uh, welcome to UCL and to the Bartlett, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for such a, a nice introduction. It is nice to be here, um, particularly because uh, I had the chance to work with Peter Hall, who I thought was absolutely marvellous. Uh, terrific fellow, did some great work with him on the airport, so sort of to come to a place where Peter spent a lot of his time is truly marvellous, and so you know, if he was here, then he's probably one of the best transport planners in the world, so as well as a planner as well as a rail buffers, all the other things anyway, so why am I here today I'm here to talk about a growing London and the role of Crossrail 2 um, and sort of like the planning that we're doing for Crossrail 2 it's worth just sort of setting in context because that was a requirement. If any of the people sitting in awkward chairs up there want to come and sit down the front, I don't mind. I don't mind you making some noise because you look a bit uncomfortable there, but if you don't, fine. Um, it's just sort of set the thing in context in terms of what we're doing. TfL, um, our, our role, our purpose is to keep London working and growing and making life in London better. It's not just about moving people around, but we do want to make life in London better. We do want to grow the city. Just in case you don't know, some folks don't, we're actually responsible for tons of stuff. It's not just the tube, it's not just the buses, um, the taxis, the congestion charging scheme, the low emission zone, um, the road network, simply because we're responsible for all the signals, we effectively control the road network, and uh, we, we move you know, freight, some £200 billion pounds worth of freight across the network. So, so we're one of the few truly integrated transport authorities. With our work with the GLA, we're able to integrate what we do with the planners there as well. We do this for the democratically elected mayor, who determines a London plan, a spatial plan. We develop a mayor's transport strategy that reflects that London plan. We develop then a business plan which says how we want to sort of spend the money that we get in terms of implementing the Mayor's Transport Strategy over a set period. The Mayor's Transport Strategy has got a whole range of objectives from supporting economic development and growth, enhancing the quality of life, um, and, and because it was written in 2.10 it goes down to supporting the delivery of the Olympic and Paralympic Games and its legacy. In terms of how we implement that strategy and the money that we get, we've got an income for the business plan of some £11 billion, 42% of which comes from fares, 17% straight grant for us and 8% for Crossrail, 6% from our commercial and uh, congestion charging monies, borrowing 20% and then 7% from business rate retention. But most of that money, two thirds of that money, goes on running the network and a third goes on investing in the network. And this is an issue because we need to grow the network because we need to respond to London's growth. Um, and that really is, is, has been a big challenge for the case for Crossrail too. Because we are growing. It's not a case of maintaining a network, just improving a network. It's allowing that network to grow and to expand. So you'll all know that we're growing to 11, 10 million by 2030. Um, some 1.4 million more people. And to put it into context, that is nine new residents appearing every hour. All over the place. Um, which is like two tube trains every week full of new people coming into London. So it's huge growth. And what we have to ensure is that we can house that population growth and we can also ensure that that population growth have jobs. So it's supporting the population through improved housing and supporting the population by enabling and encouraging the jobs that need to come um, to London. So, so we have to sort of ensure that our plans, particularly our transport plans, fit in with our spatial plans, to allow that to happen. And with all that growth, we will see a lot more uh, demand on our transport network. So uh, currently, we've, we've got sort of um, about nine and a half billion trips per year. With the growth that we're forecasting, that's going to go to 11 billion trips per year. So what are we doing to manage that growth? And recognising that that growth is also, do you just want to come in the front? Recognising that that growth is also linked to, to where the houses were going, what we have to do is try to influence the location of those houses because that will determine where these new trips will occur on the network. And there are opportunities for new housing and new employment across um, London. Two of the opportunity areas, largely brownfield sites, and areas that have been identified for intensification. So, what are we doing? What, what, are, what are we planning already? We've got a big transport investment plan. Um, not as big as we'd like it to be. 
we've got sort of a whole programme to modernise the road network, one to modernise the tube and the, the, the rail network, and you're seeing that every day, Tottenham Court Road, you're seeing sort of the digging of Crossrail itself, which is Europe's <coughs> largest infrastructure project, and we're doing a lot in terms of our cycling vision. Um, the capital programme for roads, uh, some major schemes going on, uh, Elephant and Castle, significantly major scheme, um, lots of junction improvements, all about safety, and what we do have to do is also make sure this signal system that we control is much more controlling and getting as much as possible out of the network as, as we can. For pedestrians, for cyclists, for uh, vehicles, not just for uh, four-wheeled cars, etc. Whilst we're sort of doing all that to improve the way the network operates, we're also investing a lot in improved urban realm, because good urban realm is good for the economy, it's good for London, it makes it more attractive. An example is the, is the work that we want to do at Old Street in terms of investing that. Um, the bus network, the, sort of like the, the workhorse of our public transport network, carries the majority of our public transport users, some 6 million um, passengers per day. And our plan allows for a 5% increase in that bus network. Um, but there's big demands for that to improve um, on, on a number of corridors. Not just the transport, it's the consequences of transport air quality. Lots of things that we are doing to address air quality um, because of the links to poor health. And one of the new things that we're doing, and, and we've just got through in terms of approval, is having done the, um, the, the London-wide low emission zone, we're going to introduce the ultra-low emission zone, which applies to central London. So you're actually restricted in terms of the vehicle type you can bring into central London from 2020. So we'll be specifying much tighter emission standards for the vehicles that come in. Cleaning our buses up, cleaning the taxis up, setting standards for freight vehicles as well, and that will all come on stream in 2020. Um, so a lot we're doing there. Accessibility, really important, ensuring that not only um, sort of people who can readily get around the network, but people who have more difficulty getting around the network, more can do so. So 25% of our tube stations are step-free from street to platform, and by 2024, we want 56% of them to, to be. Some of them we can never make step-free because they're old, they're being sort of configured on an old, deep network, uh, but trying to do as much as possible as we can. Two programme you all know about, you will have seen the lovely new and experienced the lovely new district line trains. Uh, many of you will experience the improvements on the Victoria line. Um, in fact, we're going to go up to 36 trains per hour on the Victoria line. Lots of big improvements at some of the stations. The Northern Line extension um, underway in terms of opening up an area um, at um, Bassley Power Station and work that we're doing to improve the district and circle line again through improved uh, signalling so that we can run more trains on that. Uh, proposals for the Piccadilly line with the new tube for London, following the new bus for London, uh, brand new smart trains in, on the deep stations that will have flat like climate control, so it won't be air conditioned, but it'll be a hell of a lot cooler than they are at present. So Piccadilly line, Bakerloo line, Central line, all for uh, further upgrading. And mustn't forget the night tube, which everybody would like to see happen, because London increasingly is a 24-hour city, and people want to be able to sort of get in and out more readily. So fingers crossed, and negotiations successful, then uh, we'd like to see that happen. So doing tons of stuff on improving the existing networks, making them better, making them more efficient. But we need new links. So going back to those opportunity areas that we showed, some of those areas aren't well connected um, to the rest of London. We need new links to open those up. And the, the evidence that we've got from previous um, examples, such as the Isle of Dogs. When I first came to London um, in the days of the GLC, the Isle of Dogs was, well, it wasn't the greatest place in the world. Uh, it's completely transformed with, with you know, f first of all, the arrival of sort of the, I can't remember which way around it was, certainly the DLR, then you've got the Jubilee Line, then you're going to get Crossrail. It's responded to that improved accessibility that those transport links have provided. Um, we're doing the same with uh, Vauxhall Nine Elms, the Northern Line extension. We wouldn't get the number of jobs and the homes that we're now able to build um, around Battersea Power Station, uh, Vauxhall Nine Elms, without the Northern Line extension. Without that accessibility, without that capacity, we wouldn't be able to develop that site in the way that we are. So linking improved transport schemes to areas where you can develop is really important. We're also doing the same with Barking Riverside. You might hear us call, call something called GOB, which is the Gospel Ope to Barking extension, and it's extending that railway into Barking so that we can build 
some 10,000 more homes, otherwise that piece of land is not connected to the network. So how we link transport to the development of homes and link those two jobs is increasingly important for Transport for London. So quite a lot of the stuff that we're doing in terms of looking at new links is making sure that we can draw those linkages. <coughs> Lots of new infrastructure projects that have been consulted on at present, uh, big schemes that we're looking at, new river crossings. Some of you might have heard about the Silvertown Tunnel, which is a way of improving the linkages across the river in the east. Uh, the Bakerloo Line extension has been consulted on a couple of times now in terms of where it should go. We have proposals for tram extensions, uh, particularly the Sutton tram link. Um, mini tunnels, road tunnels, because increasingly as we grow, the roads will get more congested. Not with vehicles, but with buses, with people cycling, with people walking, because 80% of all trips in London are made on the road network. So, so we need more space um, for, for road users as well. But our biggest priority is Crossrail 2. It's our immediate priority. This is Crossrail 2. It's a massive tunnel that will link Wimbledon all the way through the centre of London so Tottenham Hale in the north and New Southgate sort of in the north, um, north west. Um, and then when it gets to Tottenham Hale and Wimbledon, it will join the existing national rail networks. So that you'll be able to run trains from places outside of London, through London and out the other side. And because you'll be able to run some of the suburban trains that um, use those mainline paths into places like Waterloo and Liverpool Street, take them off those and stick them in the tunnel so they can run through London. You actually then relieve those paths for some longer distance services, say from Southampton and Cambridge, to use those relief paths, which is why not only we want to do this project, Network Rail wants to do this project. It's not just a London project, it's a South East regional project. It's twice as big as Crossrail 1, some 70 kilometres of tunnel, um, trains running, sort of 30 trains an hour, providing capacity of 270,000 people in the morning peak or in the a.m. peak. So it's a huge project, but it's got a huge history as well. Um, as with all the schemes that we're seeking to implement, I mean, the congestion charging scheme was invented before I was born, and I'd worked on it from about 1973, and then had the chance of you know, implementing it in 2000. Crossrail 2 has been around since 1944, so it's only 2016. Um, hopefully we will get it in by 2030. But a plotted history with all these good ideas, they, 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 they morph over time as you reassess the objectives and what's happening. Um, but we have gone through a long process of evolving this scheme, different consultations. Lots of route options that we've considered, seeing how you can join this link across London, uh, going to various places. And on the basis of all that work and optioneering, looking at long lists, we came up with three um, schemes that we consulted on, uh, which were a metro option, which was literally sort of from Wimbledon to actually New Southgate, um, a regional option, which is what we are promo promoting, versus what had been safeguarded, the Chelsea Hackney line, back in 2008. And the overwhelming support for us going forward was the regional scheme, the scheme that is described there. And if we do this, if we build Crossrail 2, it's going to have a huge impact on improving the UK's productivity. Um, and that's because it's going to help support the agglomeration that occurs in central London, allowing more people to come into central London and work in that sort of like very dense, um, active area. And cities, cities, because they do offer sort of like better transport connectivity, they allow denser levels of employment, they then, in turn, generate sort of like more productive jobs, which in turn generate greater sort of like contributions to the economy. Crossrail 2 will do the same because it will provide additional capacity into central London, which, if it doesn't do, won't be able to grow. It will address many of the transport challenges which will occur by 2030. So despite all the other stuff I told you about that we're doing, uh, we will see, particularly in central London, an increase in congestion arising after all the tube upgrade stuff because we are growing, we are growing faster necessarily than all the public transport improvements and other improvements we can make. The National Rail Network is growing um, in terms of the demand. Waterloo in particular is a sort of a major constraint um, and it's set to grow by 40%, so huge increases in demand and the severe crowding across um, those sort of like London and South East Rail Networks that we are attempting to relieve. 
So Crash Rail 2 will help address that ch transport challenge. Importantly, for London to grow, we've got to link places where you can build houses to places where you can have more productive jobs. <coughs> Crash Rail 2, because of alignment, will do that. It will link those opportunity areas with the central area where you can have the most productive jobs. And we need to do that because we've got a real shortage in terms of housing. Um, we, we're building about 25,000 houses a year. We need to build building 49,000 houses a year. And if we're going to play catch-up, then we should be on 69,000 houses a year. So places in which you can identify building those houses is really important. And up until now, we've identified of the over a million new homes required, about 4,500, four, four half, nearly half a million. Um, so not enough. And, and, and therefore... Areas where you can unlock that growth, link those areas to places where people can work, is vital for London's growth. And the reason why Crossrail 2 is so good in opening up those housing areas is if you've got a plot of land and you've got, like, as you do in parts of the Upper Lee Valley, two trains an hour, it's not really that attractive to sort of live somewhere that's two trains an hour when you're only sort of like a stone's throw from the city. So if we can put a new railway up there, increase the frequency of trains, suddenly many more people are interested in wanting to live there and developers wanting to develop there. So if you provide <coughs> those improved transport links, it makes the development areas much more attractive and many more people want to go there. So that's the sort of thing we have to do. And we've seen that happen with Crossrail 1 already. You know, Woolwich is seeing sort of like a you know, new growth taking place. Some of the other stations, particularly sort of um, Southall, other stations along the route, and it's not even open, are seeing these sort of like new um, areas develop. So Crossrail 2 is seeking to address a number of challenges. It's seeking to address congestion, particularly on the rail networks, and particularly in the southeast, where there's a major problem in people getting into London. It's seeking to sort of address the problems in central London, allowing central London to grow by providing more capacity to feed central London. It's also got a specific role in relieving HS2. So when HS2 opens, comes into Euston, everyone gets off the train, unless there's some additional capacity there over and above what's planned with the Victoria Line and Northern Line, you'll get there and then you'll stand in a queue before you can get on those tubes. So we want Crossrail 2 to be opening at the same time as Phase 2 of HS2 um, opens. In the northeast, it's very much about opening all those opportunity areas, particularly up the Upper Lee Valley. There's great opportunity for building many more homes. And in doing all that region-wide, it supports homes, it supports jobs, and it actually contributes enormously to the economy. In terms of those economic benefits, we've done some sort of detailed work with our planners, looking at each potential station around Crossrail 2, the land that can be redeveloped, the densities to which you can redevelop those, um, those areas, and identified relative to a place where you have no Crossrail to, you could actually have 200,000 more homes. We've also done the work to identify how many jobs could be provided with Crossrail 2. And it's just coincidental, not because we've only got one number that we use, it's 200,000 new jobs, some 130-odd in the centre and some 70,000 outside um, in the outer areas. It'll support 60,000 additional construction jobs. And that's not just in London, that's across um, the UK. And a piece of work that KPMG did for us was to look at the sort of the, the economic contribution that Crossrail 2 will make to the economy through promoting more jobs, through promoting more productive jobs, um, and they've estimated that it could promote up to 102 additional billion pounds um, in GVA, which is more than the cost of the scheme. You can pay for the cost of the scheme a number of times over. The cost of the scheme being some 30 billion, so it's not cheap but you can more than cover that through the, um, the economic uplift. And we've done some specific work with Volterra, um, another sort of like specialist company, on looking at the housing land value uplift that Crossrail 2 which we deliver, which is estimated at some 15 billion. As I say, the economic benefits of London um, aren't just of, of Crossrail 2, aren't just uh, <coughs> confined to London and the South East. As with Crossrail 1, um, Crossrail 2's supply chain was spread across the UK with many companies across the UK benefiting from the development of Crossrail 2 because you need to supply goods um, to build it. Um, I was talking to Louise Ellman uh, about how Crossrail 1 had helped her constituency because the majority of the lubricants that we use in TFL are made 
in her constituency, and that's up in Liverpool. So it has, it has, it has an effect on the whole of the economy across the UK, and it would support many more apprenticeships, which are important for the ongoing sort of um, employment. Transport benefits, um, Crossrail 2, it's not a London scheme. It will transform um, travel across the wider South East. As I said, it provides capacity for 270,000 more people. It's a 10% increase in capacity coming in. All the Crossrail 2 stations will be step-free, so it will play a big role in improving step-free access um, for people. And it will provide significant journey time savings across the network. And if we actually plot the transport benefits um, across the wider southeast, you can see um, London is that little red squiggle in the middle, and you can probably barely see Crossrail 2, which is a little red line going across that red squiggle. But the transport impacts spread all the way from the Solent to the Wash, because Crossrail 2, as I said before, helps relieve those mainline paths, those longer distance um, mainline paths, so more trains can run from further afield, um, as well as relieving a lot of the sort of congested networks within London. So the way we configure it, it has these very wide area effects, which is why we've got a lot of support for Crossrail 2, not just from London um, MPs and politicians, but also from um, the wider South East. Um, we've done a lot of work in calculating what Crossrail 2 can do, um, but we set up a growth commission to basically do some work to validate our findings because we might be able to say, yes, if Crossrail 2 went to this area, it would make it more attractive, you could build more homes. Um, the growth commission has sort of sought to talk to stakeholders, um, the, the planners, the boroughs along the route, say, how, how viable is it, uh, the work that TfL have said? What are the barriers to delivering those 200,000 new homes? What are the further opportunities that haven't been um, identified? And importantly, where there are opportunities, have they designed the railway in the right way? Are they putting the stations facing the right way? You know, if you've got a railway line coming up the Upper Lee Valley and your opportunity for growth is over here, you don't put your front door facing that away. So making sure that we, we design it so that we can maximise those development opportunities. And so the Growth Commission is uh, a group of, sort of like professionals with experience who are going around seeking to validate our findings to make sure Crossrail 2 does and can deliver on the growth that we have said it could. And that's going to report back um, in the spring of this year. And much of the work that it does will also help inform some of the revised London Plan policies that we might need to take forward um, as a result of the work that we are doing. Now, it's some 30 billion, this scheme, and the big question that everyone's asking is, how are you going to pay for it? Where's the money going to come from? So in terms of a policy question, this is one of the big policy questions. You know, we've got 11 billion, two-thirds of that's spent on operating the network, only a third spent on investing. We need to find ways of getting more money so we can invest more in the transport improvements that are required in London. And I've said Crosswell 2 is a priority, but there's a whole lot of other things that we want to do. But how can we pay for Crosswell 2? And despite the fact that everybody supports Crosswell 2, um, nobody necessarily wants to pay for it. But if you build this thing, there's lots of people who benefit from it. The obvious people who benefit from it are the passengers that ride on it. So fares, yep, fares, we'll take their fares. That's, so the operating surplus there is the fares minus the cost to operate it. So fares obviously can contribute towards the payment of Crossrail 2. Another group of people that benefit from Crossrail 2 will be businesses who will be able to have more um, employees get to their businesses and more visitors get to their businesses. So asking the businesses to contribute towards Crossrail 2 through a business plate supplement seems a reasonable approach, particularly if we use the approach that was set for Crossrail 1. Developers, people who own land, people who can develop that land, people who will have the, 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 the benefits of the increased value of better connectivity that Crossrail 2 will deliver, they'll benefit from the scheme. Their, their land becomes more valuable. And so, uh, again, as with Crossrail um, 1, we set up a mayoral SIL, a mayoral community infrastructure levy. And we would seek to extend that levy to apply to Crossrail 2. So development um, would have to pay a contribution towards Crossrail 2. 
There's also the opportunity in certain areas that if you have to sort of like develop a station and you have to buy the land around that station um, and there's an opportunity to develop it, there's, there's, there's contributions that can come from oversight development. But we want to make sure that oversight development fits in with the locality. And we've estimated what the, sort of like the, the resale uh, of, of land and property is in association with that oversight development. We've also made the assumption that um, there is a council tax preset that was set up for the Olympics. Is that twenty pounds for Bandy properties per year? Um, it's going down to, to eight pounds. And and what we've assumed is if you could keep that, that's another contribution that could um, benefit. Because lots of residents across across, rail, across the area will benefit because their lines, even though they're not next to Crossrail Two, are relieved by Crossrail Two. And if you add up all that lot, we get fifty six percent to be able to contribute 56% of the cost. And that's the challenge that George Osborne gave us. Can you find half? So we found more than half. Um, and now they've said, can you find more? So, <laughs> But we can. We can identify more because as with Crossrail 1, which isn't even open, we have seen um, house prices um, in the vicinity of Crossrail 1 stations go up more than houses away from those Crossrail 1 stations. And without doing anything else, the exchequer will collect more money. Because when that house is like bought and sold, stamp duty is paid. And so, because the value of the house has gone up, more stamp duty gets paid. So the exchequer will collect more stamp duty. So we've said if we deliver the 200,000 new homes that you wouldn't get if you didn't have Crossrail 2, they're additional stamp duty generators. And those 200,000 new homes between now and 2060 could generate about £5 billion of additional monies. There's the other group of residential properties, which are the existing homes, which just go up in value as well. And again, the exchequer ben benefits from that when they're bought and sold because they get stamp duty on those. And our estimates is you get about £15 billion worth of additional stamp duty. So we've said to the government, we can identify the 56%. And you're going to get 20 billion, and that more than covers the other half. So there's your case. Um, not sure that they necessarily just take it like that, but I think it's a pretty good case in terms of uh, this is about growth, it's supporting growth, it's about saying what growth means, which is you know, more taxes to the exchequer, and we would want to um, justify getting some of that money back in order to cover the costs of Crossrail 2. There is talk about like more general devolution, whether the business rates can be devolved to, to, to authorities such as London, and that would allow us to you know, do more potentially than Crossrail 2, but that has to be a, a debate that, that's had with the boroughs and with the mayor about how that would be shared. Other things that were considered in terms of ways in which Crossrail 2 could be paid for, other funding sources, um, were identified in a piece of work that Pricewaterhouse did back in 2014, and things that were looked at, the employment tax, which is a way of raising money for schemes, um, particularly in Paris, which is certainly something Peter Hall's work had identified in terms of paying for some of the fast train, train schemes in, 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 in France. They, they do it in New York as well, but people aren't too keen on you know, that sort of tax. We looked at a hotel bed levy, because visitors to London will benefit from Crossrail too, but People aren't necessarily so keen on that. We looked at the opportunities for developing the greenfield. Um, because of the pressure to build homes in London, you know, is there a debate about whether or not you could build some new homes in some parts of the greenfield? People aren't too keen on that. And then if you're able to increase the fares over and above what we have at present, again, you could raise more money, but people aren't too keen on that. So the package that we had has, has a level of so a level of support for it in terms of being reasonable. Um, nevertheless, in, in, in making our case to government about funding Crossrail 2, we will need to look at other opportunities. But I think, I think our starting case is quite a solid case. So what are we doing? What's the programme for delivery? You know, what, 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 what happens next? A number of you will be aware that we've just finished a public consultation on Crossrail 2. This is the fourth consultation that we've done on Crossrail 2 since 2013. Um, the first was looking at the, the options of the Metro scheme 
the, um, the regional scheme and uh, overwhelming support for the regional scheme because of its wider benefits. The second consultation was looking specifically at the regional scheme and some variants on the regional scheme about which stations the regional scheme served. And there were some options around Hackney, um, some options around Kings Road. Um, and the conclusion from that work was to say, let's go to Kings Road. And the conclusion from that was, let's go to Dalston uh, Junction through the Hackney area. And there was another part that was consulted on as whether or not we extended it up to New Southgate from Alexander Palace. We then did a third consultation on a safeguarded um, proposal, which included all those um, stations, and the safeguarding was confirmed by the Secretary of State last March. Lots of people commented on it. We've been refining the proposal since those comments, and then we did a big consultation starting in October of this year that finished January the 8th to say, if the stations are in these locations, if this is the alignment, then this is how we'd have to build it. Because... Lots of people think Crossrail 2 is a brilliant idea, but as soon as it goes near you, and as soon as you're affected by it, then your attitude towards it sort of is, a bit, is a bit more concerning. You know, suddenly, if you get a, a letter saying the tunnel comes under your house, we sent one to the mayor, he was a bit horrified, because it does, um, then, then people are, well, what's it going to do to my house? Will it, will it you know, affect my foundations? Will I hear it? As soon as you show to build these stations, even though it's underground, you still have to do some digging, you still have to allow the stations to pop up, you've got to have entrances, and you also have to have um, ventilation shafts to allow the air to escape from the tunnels. And when you show the locations of those, people get concerned. So that consultation was all about people's concerns about the local impacts of Crossrail 2 in terms of where we were locating it, what it would do. Um, we've had 19, over 19,000 responses to that consultation and we're considering the, sort of the comments that people have made. Um, there's still a lot of support for it as a, as a scheme, but there are concerns about exactly how does it fit in with, with our you know, ind individual people's immediate locality. Um, so we will be going through those consultation responses and uh, we will be seeking to make um, revisions to mitigate people's concerns and identify what we call sort of like a single preferred scheme later this year that we will consult on again. In the meantime, um, the government set up something called the National Infrastructure Commission. Set it up last November. Um, it's chaired by Lord Adonis, and um, it's to look at, they, they gave him the task of looking at some specific infrastructure schemes and making recommendations on whether or not they should be further developed. And the first three schemes that they asked the National Infrastructure Commission to look at were firstly public transport schemes in London, including Crossrail 2, um, schemes that would be identified by the Northern Powerhouse, and, and an energy scheme. Um, and they invited people to make comments on the, you know, the importance of um, schemes in addressing challenges um, for localities, and they will sort of uh, make some recommendations on those schemes in March of this year. And based on those recommendations, the government will consider whether or not it will give us what we've been asking for, which is the further development money to take the scheme forward. Because with a scheme the size of Crossrail 2, it's not just you know peanuts to sort of take that scheme forward. It's quite a lot of investment required to do the development work, to do the more detailed design, to do all the environmental impact assessment work, so like to work out exactly you know, what's going to happen before, post, uh, during construction, and, and, and to prepare for the powers that are required um, to take the scheme forward. We would like to take the scheme forward through a hybrid build process. Um, we need the government support in doing that, in terms of allowing the time, as well as supporting the process. Um, and so if, if, if the government support the scheme based on the National Infrastructure Commission's um, recommendations, what we would like is to get a go-ahead in March of this year to proceed um, as, as we're doing in order that we can put an application in to get powers to build the scheme in 2017-2018. If we do that, then we should be able to get those powers by 2020, start construction and have the scheme up and running by 2030-2031. Now, there's, a, there's an end date here that we're keen on getting to. I mentioned HS2 earlier. What we don't want is we don't want HS2 phase 2 opening 
and Crossrail 2 not being opened. Now that's planned to open 2032. We also, when you've got all those works taking place at Euston, and we've got a station at Euston, want to try and coordinate our activity with the other activity in Euston so we're not digging so like lots of holes for too long in an area. So trying to coordinate what we're doing with Euston is important. Um, and that sort of determines that end date to a certain extent. And that's the programme that we are seeking to work to. But lots of challenges, proving the funding case, proving the actual strategic case, winning the support of um, locals in terms of what we're doing at a local level, as well as maintaining the support that we've currently got for the scheme at a strategic level. And that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, um, Michelle, for that very uh, concise and uh, information-rich presentation. Uh, we've got some time now for, uh, for questions. Um, my aim in offering the opportunity for questions and comments uh, is to ensure as many people as possible get the chance to uh, make their points. So it would help enormously if you make your points as concisely as Michelle made hers, uh, and that way... Uh, the maximum number of people will get the chance to, to speak. Okay, so uh, who would like to ask the first question? Yes, sir, you. Are there any particular challenges you see Crossroads who are happy to overcome to pass hybrid build? Uh, any of the other projects? Uh, lots. Um, I mean, the, ch the challenges will be to appease people who object to it and to, so like, to, to work with people who are concerned about it in coming up with solutions, particularly at the local level, that, that, that sort of demonstrate that the scheme will fit in to those local environments. Um, so, so there are lots of challenges that we have to address. And we've got some that, we, we, that have arisen as a result of the consultation. Um, you'll be aware, I'm sure, about people's concerns, um, particularly, say, um, that there's a ball and tooting debate um, that's going on. Um, because it's very difficult for us to build a station at Tooting um, because of the geology there, then we propose Balham as an alternative. But there's a lot of support to go to Tooting. And, and, and what, what we want people to appreciate is if you go to Tooting, there'll be a lot of disruption. It, the, 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 the analogy that some people say is if you build a station at Balham, it'd be a bit like keyhole surgery. If you build a station at Tooting, it'd be more like open heart surgery. And if people are prepared for that, that, that's very different to um, sort of where, where, where we want them to understand what they're saying yes to. Um, but lots, lots of people are more supportive of tooting than they are of Balham. Um, that's an issue. Uh, the other issue that we get is the, vent the ventilation shafts that I talked about. It's a piece of infrastructure. You think, why have I got that next to me? You know, what, what good is that? It's obviously good for the railway. Um, so our challenge is to make sure that where we put these things can blend as best as possible into the local environment so, so you don't see them. And in many instances, they can just look like buildings. You know, they can be designed to look like buildings or they can be designed to look like raised pieces of grass. Um, so so, so th th they're the sorts of issues that we're facing at the moment. But before the, we get there, our biggest issue is to, is to sort of like deal with the funding challenge. Yes, sir. Uh, None of these things are additive. They're, they're different ways of presenting the benefits of the scheme and the, and the actual sort of the funding streams, which the table that I showed um, with the SIL, is, is where the revenues are going to come from. How do you collect that value? And what we've done in terms of the SIL is we've looked at the values that are currently applied, the mayoral SIL values, versus the borough SIL values. 
and, and obviously developers, if, if there are two sills operating in an area, want to sort of not have too much to have to pay so that it stifles their development. So what we have done is we've looked at um, the mayoral sill relative to the borough sills going forward and whether or not you can increase the, the value of the mayoral sill, but also importantly, there'll be an increase in yield of the mayoral sill because there's much more development happening. So, so that, that's, that's an estimate of what you can actually collect in terms of that land value back. Michael. This is another land value related question with my paper in this uh, It's a kind of long term strategic question. The justification for London's further growth is usually made mainly in terms of agglomeration economies and the growth of GDP and GDA. But to make it feasible to grow that, we have to invest heavily in infrastructure. This is a way circular process. The more we grow, the more we need infrastructure. Real estate value uplift, which could be harvested or another to try to finance it. How would we ever know when London was the optimum size and it was best to stop? It's a question that's being asked as part of the um, revision to the London plan, and it was certainly a question that was being asked as part of the 2050 infrastructure plan, where we look beyond 2030, and we're looking towards London's growth to 2050, where you were talking about, I think it was 13 and a half um, million people, and whether or not, A, you'd want to accommodate it, and B, how you'd want to accommodate it. And, and, and with that, there's, there's the growth of people and housing the population versus supporting the, the jobs. And if there is a desire to um, invest from overseas, in jobs in certain areas, there's a question, do you, do you turn that away or do you seek to accommodate it? And if you seek to accommodate it, where do the workers come from? Where do the workers live? How do you link where they could live to where those jobs are? So, so it, is, it is a live debate, certainly it's something being looked at um, right up to 2050. What people felt f during that work was our proposals to sort of seek to accommodate that growth within London are still valid because we do want to capture that economic value. And if you look at London, we can accommodate it. And we can sort of like square the circle. But where we go beyond um, those sort of like higher numbers, that's a different, well, it's a further challenge that we'd have to face. Because there are people who are saying, why are you trying to accommodate it at all? Why don't you let the growth go somewhere else? Why don't you let it go sort of outside of London? Um, and, it, and it's whether or not, A, the people who are making those decisions are wanting to do that, but also it does link back to this, this issue of where is it most productive to have that growth. Um, and that there was work that we did as part of the Mayor's Transport Strategy, and there was some work that was done as part of the 2050 plan to say, could we have a lot more productive growth, more productive growth in, say, out of London? But to get that more productive growth, we need to invest much, much more in those public transport networks to support that than we do if we want to invest and make that grow in central London. So that's why we're continuing with that radial um, network proposal. Yes, Richard. So, uh, Richard McCarthy from Capita. And Michelle, um, two questions related about the development. You mentioned the uh, review of the Greater London Plan, which has now started. Assuming you get the funds up in March, uh, maybe announcement in budget or whatever. Um, are you planning to ensure that actually the Greater London Plan immediately starts to recognise <coughs> the future of Crossrail 2 and allow for greater density, greater height around stations all the way through the line beyond the Wilmerdons and down into the south west and into the areas to the north of London? And secondly, what action are you taking now in your early work on station design to ensure that the station itself is a node, a centre of development, as opposed to simply the facilitator of development beyond it? Uh, in, ter in terms of the influence of the work that we're doing on the London Plan, we're working alongside our colleagues who are working on the London Plan because we <coughs> recognise to support that growth, we need the infrastructure, and if you need the infrastructure, how can you maximise the development <coughs> around each of those stations? So, so it's work that's taking place side by side. We have colleagues in my room who are working on both projects, um, who, who are doing some of that planning work. 
And, and what we want to do is, is to sort of ch try and make some recommendations that the London plan policies at present will need to be reviewed in light of London's growth so that you can have more dense development around stations with very good public transport accessibility than currently occur. And, 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 and therefore you can have higher levels of development within, say, you know, a kilometre uh, radius of those stations. Um, we also want to review sort of where you do have these stations with very good sort of services, high capacity, that the land uses around those stations are, are appropriate for that. So if, you, if you've got sort of a station and it's just surrounded by storage sheds, that's not you know, a good use of that land. It doesn't mean you don't have storage sheds, but what can you do to have more mixed development in that area? Because certainly strategic industrial land is a sensitive issue. If you can have a station, it's high frequency, you've got to house more people. Ideally, you want as many people as possible around that station, but you do need local jobs, you do need to support the local economy, so how can you collate, co-locate co some of that? So, so we feel that the work of the Growth Commission will help inform some of that um, decision-making and provide an input into the London plan. Um, and, and in terms of sort of... Uh, are the stations going to be centres? Well, they will in some instances, and in other instances, they, they, they will be improving the connectivity, not just um, at that location, but through that location. Because we've done some work on um, if cert certain stations are connected to areas where you can develop, say, by you know, a tram link or uh, some other link. And the, the, the improvement from going from that area to this link is such that it makes that other area more attractive. So some of the work that we've done to identify where these additional homes can occur isn't just immediately on those stations, it's over a slightly wider area. It's, maximi it's maximising that investment as much um, as we can. I'm going to ask you to wait a second. You wanted to ask a question. What do you think are the biggest risks to success of the project? Sorry, I missed that. And what do you think are the biggest risks to the success of the project? Um, I think in terms of the... The risks it will it will be making the case to get the funding. I think the the it's it's a big project, but it's got big returns. It's going to have a big impact on London. Uh, people might think it's too big an investment, and you know, can we do something cheaper? Can we, can we make do with a lesser scheme or part of the scheme? And I think getting it chopped up or delayed is is, is a risk. So so our job is to make sure that the case that we're making is made as clearly as possible and the benefits beyond transport are seen. Because it is not just a transport scheme, it's a housing scheme, it's a job scheme, it's a growth scheme. Yes. Yeah, Steve Moxall from Regeneration X. Could you say a bit more about um, productivity growth? Because I, I thought I'd read that actually one of the reasons we've laid behind our competitors is because we're too focused on service level jobs in, in London. And it's very, very difficult to actually gain productivity, productivity gains from service jobs. So well, we, do, we do lag behind in terms of some of our competitors in terms of productivity, but the work that we've done is showed this sort of strong link between more productive jobs and more densely located jobs. It doesn't matter what they are, but more densely located. So more dense development of jobs is served by better public transport and, 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 and better sort of denser networks. So there's a piece of work that has been done um, which looks at the relationship between um, productivity of jobs and density of jobs and density of jobs and density of the network. So if you can increase the network in areas that are dense and make it more dense, you increase the productivity. That's the relationship that we've been working with. Uh, there'll, there'll be different jobs. I mean, at the moment, we haven't sort of sought to identify exactly what jobs are what. Um, within central London, obviously, you've got a range of jobs, some more in financial services, you've got sort of jobs in, in other areas, but also beyond central London, you've got sort of like jobs that are supporting the local economies. And, and some of the work that the Outer London Commission did was also to look to see whether or not there are pockets of um, jobs where they're sort of, they, they, they have their own like mini agglomeration, you know, media jobs, you know, high tech jobs, medical jobs. Um, and can we promote more of those centres, particularly outside of central London? Yes, at the back. Speak up. Um, related to your discussion on uh, densification and shape of the city, do you have an idea yourself of what shape of city you'd like to live in? Density <coughs> areas, more distributed? What's your, your picture of 
picture of an ideal London and perhaps an ideal um, I, I, would, I would like to see more density in central London. I'd like to see more homes in central London, more homes are coming to central London. I'd like to see greater density around public transport stations in inner London. I'd also like to see in, in outer London, sort of around those stations, denser developments. I'd also like to make sure we've still got open spaces and that you know, we have got a green city, that you know, the greenness and the attractiveness of this city is something that makes people want to come and invest here and, and to live and work here. And one of the things that we, we have been trying to sort of get across in explaining we want a more dense city, it doesn't mean it has to be a tall city. It doesn't mean those buildings have to be tall high-rise. Um, one of the most dense boroughs is, is Kensington and Chelsea. And people, I think, would agree that you know, the nature of those buildings is very attractive. So how can you get better densification, particularly around public transport nodes, that allow that uh, greater growth to occur? Um, I suppose, in some ways, I might be a hypocrite in commenting on that, because I don't actually live in London. <coughs> I don't live in Grimsby anymore, either. So. It's an interesting question, what, all this, what, is all, what does all this mean for a place like Grimsby? Well, in Grimsby, there's lots of homes. There's not as many jobs. Um, and, and that's why sort of people, you, know, you, you can live like a king in Grimsby if you've got a job um, and the homes are very good value um, but if you haven't got a job it's not much fun so, so people, people want to be where jobs are so, so. so how do you see this fitting in with the Northern Powerhouse agenda? Uh, I, I see it fitting in very well because many of the cases or the cases that we're making for Crossrail 2 we've been working with our colleagues um, up north in, in them making the same sort of cases for their cities. Improved connectivity leads to sort of improved, in, improved sort of like um, employment density it leads to improved productivity. So the arguments that we've been making for Crossrail 2, one would want to sort of see you know, our colleagues make for, um, for the northern powerhouse schemes. And what we have said, it's, it's, it's not a zero-sum game. It's not, a, it's not a case of if we grow, Manchester can't grow and Leeds can't grow. If, if you invest properly, you should all be able to grow, particularly if you're attracting investment from, from, from outside of the UK. Okay. This, you've been asking, waiting patiently. I've got a couple of cats. Two points. One is an observation, one is a question. The first one, um, just picking on the point about the hybrid build, I would say as an industry, we're getting a lot better at doing hybrid builds. Um, we're currently supporting HS2 with a hybrid build, and um, we've certainly seen. Uh, the process a lot slicker, a lot quicker from lessons learned from Crossrail 1 hybrid build. And I think maybe there's something there in the planning of actually looking at optimising a hybrid build. And there's certainly been some advancements in how, this is the wrong word, processing petitioners, but in essence getting them through at a lot quicker rate than we, we've seen before. Um, so that's the point. The question is, we've got a, a merit election coming up, and um, we're doing some work at the IC with manifestos. On that term, I wondered that we've seen um, repeatedly that having a strong political lead on these major projects is absolutely crucial. And with one mayor going and a new one coming in, how that's factored in? I wonder what your thoughts were. Well, I think I think I think sort of the good thing about Crossrail too is we've got cross-party support. You know, it's, you haven't got one mayor that supports it, or a mayoral candidate that supports it, and another mayoral candidate that doesn't support it. We've got cross-party support. Um, there, was a, there was a sort of Comres survey done in relation to Heathrow where they were asking about, you know, what's the most important um, piece of transport infrastructure? And it was named as Crossrail 2. Sort of, it wasn't, I don't think, what the Heathrow survey expected, but Crossrail 2 uh, was the, you know, the favoured um, piece of transport infrastructure. And that included MPs from across the, the you know, the UK. Um, so I, I, I don't see that the change of mayor in this particular instance will change um, the scheme because we've got good support from across the board thus far. <laughs> Touch wood. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I believe there's been a you request know, from Surrey County Council and others in that sort of direction to extend to Guildford, Woking, and other places mm. like that. Well, what, what we try to sort of explain to people is we don't need to extend Crossrail 2 to those areas because they will benefit from these improved services on the main line. So, so, so going back to my point before, if you've got suburban rail networks and trains are trundling along there and then they join the main line paths into Waterloo, then they're, they're preventing or 
you're not going to get much more growth on those mainline paths. Take those trains off, stick them in the tunnel, it relieves those paths, and then you can run some longer distance services from outside of London into Waterloo. So, so we will get huge benefits for train users, not directly on the Crossrail 2 lines as a result of Crossrail 2, which is why that green transport benefit um, chart shows it extending sort of so widely. But, but most people think it's a new station, I, I, you know, I need to be on it. But Crossrail 2 is a stopping service. It's, it's, not a, it's not a fast service, it's a stopping service. And if you've got a, you know, a non-stopping train that's taking you from Guildford in or whatever, then you don't want to be on a stopping service um, going into London. Okay. Any, uh, any other? Yes, right at the very back. And then you... Well, if you looked at the, the um, probably didn't have a chance to look at it because I whizzed through it, uh, the slide in terms of optioneering, certainly the optioneering that we did looked at whether it went to Stretton, went here, went there, went everywhere. And the best scheme that we, we identified for the southwest sector was a, was a station that would intersect with the northern line. Um, because the northern line, particularly north of Balham, is one of the most congested parts of the network. So, so we wanted to have a station that would relieve the northern line. Um, it so happened that Tooting, before we knew about the geology, was a better station. Um, but now we know about the geology. Ballum, just up, um, will actually provide relief to the Northern Line as well. Uh, it so happens that if, if we went to Ballum instead of Tooting, that helps Streatham as well because you've got a direct you know, train link into um, Ballum. You can change, get onto the Crossrail 2 there. And so there is some support from the, Ballum, from the Lambeth area for a station in Ballam, but there's equally a lot of support to tooting. Yes. Um, um, as we can see, uh, it's a universal that the misalignments of plan and actual outcomes happens to piles of major infrastructures during the projects during the around the world. And what is the major driven forces of the of London's economic growth and infrastructure demand so that we can see the future risk scenario according to the cost of two. Can you ask that again? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. It's the misalignment of what is planned and mm. what is actual outcomes of the major projects. And so, uh, and we can see in your lectures that um, uh, there is a growing, in, increasing demand for infrastructure yeah. and transport. And uh, the, the op 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 optimistic uh, of the economic growth. Uh, what about some risks and uh, emerging conditions happen to that? Uh, well, in, in, in terms of is this the right thing for the future? Are we going to invest? It's not going to deliver. Are we? Excuse me. <coughs> Spending on the wrong thing. That's all about sort of like the forecasting that we do and what allowances we make for sort of changes. You know, what if the growth isn't as big as that? What if the growth is less than that? How does that affect the case for the scheme? So in terms of our case making, we look at those sort of um, those ranges. So if, if the growth was less, is it still a good scheme? If the growth is more, is it still a good scheme? Um, <coughs> Importantly, what we're trying to do with Crossrail 2, which, which is something that um, <coughs> may, may, may not have always worked in the past with some <coughs> schemes, is make, making sure that as a transport scheme, it is aligned to areas where growth can take place um, and that the transport facilities required for that scheme don't stifle development because we put something in the wrong place. So we, 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 we will look at the risk. We've also got within our figures optimism bias to sort of increase the cost to allow for that. There's lots of risk um, assessments within that. Um, but what, what we don't want to do is to sort of design a railway and it not support the growth that it could support because we've not taken that growth and how it can be supported into account in the design. Uh, some people might sort of comment on, um, and it, it's, it's a sort of a, an issue about the, with, with Crossrail 1, 
um, because that depot is in an area now, now that HS2 is coming up, exactly where you'd want to put a load of development because it's right next to the station and it's going to be you know, a huge development area. Um, and you can now consider, you know, can you do oversight development? But, but, but had, the, had, had the project been approached in the same way as we're approaching Crossrail 2, which is because we've got the hindsight of learning from that, um, then perhaps you would have allowed for oversight development at the outset. Or you might have considered that even from a transport operational point of view, that's the best place to put sort of a maintenance depot or whatever. From a growth perspective and looking at the scheme in the round, maybe it's not the best place. So, so that, that's one way of trying to um, improve the outcomes by making sure those two things are designed together. Right, I don't know if that answers your question, but... Okay. There's a lot of hands going up and there's not much time. So, at the back, yeah? <coughs> um, in relation to the housing challenge, uh, right now, without Crossrail, people are already living further and further out, but uh, we're not seeing the affordability of housing. Uh, well, we're not seeing housing being more affordable. Uh, but with cross rails, uh, the outer areas they would be more accessible, which I, I assume the housing prices would just increase. So, uh, do you think uh, the cross rail is the best hope for this country, uh, for London at least, to address this housing crisis? In, in, t in terms of cross rail too, because it is opening up, particularly those very large opportunity areas up the Upper Lee Valley, which, which aren't being developed um, at the rate that you'd want to see them because they're not attractive, that will um, provide an environment that, that developers will find more attractive to build those homes. The more homes you build, then, then even though I've talked about house prices going up in the vicinity of this, it's trying to build more homes so they don't go up as much as they would do if you could only build a few homes. So, so you, want, you want as many homes as possible to be built, you want as high densities as, as people will allow to be built around here, so you can maximise that investment. And one of the things, particularly about the Upper Lee Valley, is it's not that far from where jobs will be. And, 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 and people, sort of like if, if we look at the, sort of the, um, the willingness to commute patterns, the willingness to commute drops off quite substantially after about 45 minutes. So you can't just keep on thinking, let's build more railway lines that take you further and further and further afield. The more homes we can put within <coughs> that 45-minute commute of, say, some of those jobs that are going to arise, the better. So, so I, 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 think, I think Crossrail 2 will make a huge difference to building those homes, but it's not the only thing that needs to be done in London. We need to look at the, the delivery mechanisms for those homes. And there is a piece of work that's been done as part of the London Land Commission about how much more public land can be brought um, together and made available so that more homes can be built. How can you encourage more home building um, generally? Wait, it's the last question. Yours. Blake Driscoll from Arcadis. Uh, thank you again for your time. The, the question of monetizing some of the benefits, you spoke quite, quite well about the strategic benefits, transport user benefits, housing jobs, but transport user benefits tend to be the easier ones to monetize. So I was wondering how you accommodate some of the assumptions around jobs and housing in terms of land use and land use planning assumptions um, to make your station decisions rather than route wide decisions. Uh, much, much of the station decisions are based on modelling and, and looking at the sort of like, you know, what's the configuration of homes going, going forward um, around those areas, what relief can we afford, what connectivity that we can deliver, and that's been done on, on sort of like tra transport modelling. But then we've looked at, um, separate to that, in addition to that, um, what extra sort of uh, development can take place in that location if Crossrail 2 is built and, you know, can the station cope with that additional capacity? So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a combination of looking at transport stuff and growth stuff. When you say that transport benefits can be easily changed, I mean, sort of, they... they you, you, you can increase your transport benefits by, in, in many ways, chopping out stations. Um, but then you're not actually uh, dealing with the, the growth opportunities. You know, if you just went, say, from Wimbledon all the way to um, Clapham Junction, didn't stop at all. I'm sure that would help some of those um, people who are making that journey a lot. But it's not actually addressing, A, the Northern Line, or 
the sort of growth opportunities on the route. Okay, I'm going to um, draw proceedings to a close at this point. I'm, I apologise to those of you who would have liked to have asked a question but haven't been able to on this occasion. Hopefully you'll get another occasion in the future. Um, I'd like to uh, thank Michelle for her uh, rich and insightful uh, presentation, for the engaging way she's dealt uh, with your questions, and I'd like to thank uh, you, the audience, for coming up with such a, uh, a testing uh, range of questions for <coughs> Michelle to answer. Um, so uh, we will. Um, I'm inviting you to join us for a drink in the South Cloister. If you don't know where that is, just follow the rush, um, and that should lead you there. Um, the uh, it all that remains is for me to ask you to to thank Michelle uh, in the traditional way.